Hey, everybody, welcome to the Ellsworth Exchange. I am joined today by the incredible Simon Spurrier. Cy Spurrier, how are you, sir? Very, very good. Thank you. Nice to be here. Oh, great to have you, man. Uh, I'm so excited to talk about your career, your work, uh, get into the into the nitty gritty, as it were, uh, because and this is, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your work. My wife digs the crap out of your stuff, man. And <laughs> it has and I have learned by now that if she digs something, A, it's definitely worth checking out and B, I should be paying attention. And uh, that definitely put me back onto, and I remember being- Refinement and taste. Oh, of course, yes, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, the only thing that I question her taste on is her taste in men. That being said, (laughs) uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, everything under the sun. Uh, The fact that you're, I think part of what is uh, not being referred to colloquially unfortunately as the new british invasion of comics yeah uh, <laughs> we've had enough of those right <laughs> listen i'm i'm happy with it because every time it happens i'm like oh we get folks like al ewing kieran <laughs> gillen and Simon Spurrier. i'm down uh oh and just so happens that that's like the brain trust for uh an entire event for x-men and uh <laughs> and it's some and some damn good stuff um Thank you. what uh what brought you into comics uh mainstream comics what were some of the comics that grew up that you grew up reading that uh if if you did or if you came into the into the hobby late i mean it's a, a i was late uh, i guess the so i don't know if it's the same in the states but here we have um what i'd call like kids comics which are quite distinct from from which is not to say that the sorts of stuff i now do are are not for kids if you see what i mean but the, sure. I'm talking about the sort of very um slapsticky cartoony stuff over here we've got the dandy and the beano and and those sorts of things mm-hmm. so i would have read some of those when i was a kid so i the reason i mention that is because it's not immediately obvious to a lot of adult friends who have never read comics how to decode the visual vernacular that we that we see as the sort of you know when, when you've been reading comics from a child um or just for any length of time it becomes second nature we we don't think it's unusual that that our brains jump from panel to panel and you know leftwards and sorry rightwards and downwards or or however it works in whichever part of the world you're in right but i, I must have been exposed to to those kind of kids comics as a kid because by the time i, I had forgotten about them for many years and i was in my sort of mid-teens when i stumbled upon um uh Judgment on Gotham, the Judge Dredd Batman crossover in a in a bookstore near me, and was immediately sort of taken by the kind of gurning, busily, you know, overly muscled. What the hell is this? So you know, I'm sort of vaguely aware of Batman as a thing, but that's not what I expected Batman to 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 look like. Um, and picked it up and and very quickly got into it, and and that was sort of the the ball rolling. That whole Dredd angle quickly leads you to 2000 ad which um for the purpose of those don't know is the the sort of uh venerable british mostly science fiction comic that we have here it's an anthology title comes out every week five or six very short chapters of ongoing stories within it broadly sci-fi but it also does horror and crime and all sorts of things and and the 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 kind of um the connective gristle behind all of these different stories from all these different genres is uh, a level of punk is an over word, uh, an overused word, but punky anger is yes. sort of where, where 2000 AD comes from. Anger about stuff that, that should be better than it is and uh, stories that utilize genre metaphors to try and speak to the, the world. And it's very British and it's very um difficult to make some of those stories and characters land in the the kind of the the american especially superhero of and yet uh, to your to your point about the the british invasions (laughs) it, it clearly does translate sometimes more in that direction than in the other because one of the things that comes hand in hand with 2000 ad is the the wealth of ideas is always more important than um, any sort of decompression or or kind of like there's this conversation um, yeah yeah and, and, and i get really fed up this is a little bit of a tangent i warned you that i'm that I, i'm a tangential waffler so here we go that makes uh, for a good show i'm happy for it uh, this is, <laughs> you might have to pull me back a bit um the the adjective du jour is confident 
people will pick up a book off a shelf and they'll go, oh, it's so confident. It's so confident. Now, to me, what that means, can I swear, by the way? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're good. What that means is it took five fucking seconds to read and it cost you four or five dollars and it's a waste of money and it's a waste of time. Confidence equals didn't have any story to tell, just sort of plopped some atmospheric nonsense across 22 pages and then, hey, look at us, we're masterpieces. <laughs> you hate that. 2000 AD, five pages or six pages per issue in each of these anthology slots. Ultra dense. The economy of storytelling is as important as the story and the character itself. To the extent that when I was first getting into all this, and I'm jumping ahead now, um, the editor responded to my first submissions by saying, here's a really interesting exercise. Go and pick up an issue of an American comic, 22 pages, try and rewrite it as a five page strip. Hmm. And it's a lot easier than you would think it is, generally speaking, because most of it is just extraneous tasks that you can compress down. Absolutely. Um, and to fill in the gap, basically, I started reading 2000 AD. I was 16. I decided that all this stuff that I was greatly enjoying, obviously I could do it better than anybody else because clearly I'm a masterpiece in, in human form. I'm going to sit <laughs> down and start sending all these submissions in. And they were terrible, just god awful, cliche riddled, dreadful, dreadful stuff. Yeah. Um, and it took me about two years of sending in a submission every couple of months before it actually occurred to me to take to heart the advice in the editor's replies. This editor taking the time to actually try and help me. And I was like, what does he know? Pile of crap. I'm going to send in another sure. bullshit submission that nobody will read. So eventually I started paying attention. Um, that snowballed into uh, I got my first gig. I got my second gig, which is even harder than my first gig. You start out by doing these little um, one shot stories called future shocks, which are sort of sci fi twist in the tail, um, self contained stories. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll read interviews with some of the, the kind of really big names of 2080s past, like your, your Alan Moores and your Grant Morrison's and your Mark Alan Mars Grant, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, they'll say things like, if you can master the future shock, especially if you can then master the sort of five to six page ultra diamond dense episodic form, everything else is easy after that. Mm. Sort of you move across the pond, if you're lucky enough to start doing that, or if you're crazy enough to start doing that, then yeah. quite quickly you're sort of loosening your belt a little bit. Oh, I've got 22 pages I only need. It's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then it's quite hard to go back in the other direction. Sure. So uh, even now, like once every few years, I try to I try to send the editor at, at 2080 a future shock or two just to sort of keep keep my hand in a bit to yeah prove i can still do it but anyway that's an extremely long answer to your question no i love it because it's uh it's it's insightful and i think that a lot of the uh, audience is interested in knowing not just like how you got started but also like the avenues through which you re you reach this point and 2080 is i i love that it is such a common denominator in so many uh yeah. uh different prolific writers stories uh where what's, 2008 what's, is this form this formative punk rock yeah. uh f headstone uh yeah and what's so great about it is that it it's one of the very few um western comic publishers that has a dedicated way in you know, mm. for writers especially, you know, artists, they have, if all else fails, they have Artists Alley, Portfolio Reviews, all of those things at conventions. It's very difficult as a writer to, to sort of know where to begin. And, and funnily enough, all the advice I have for writers who are trying to break in is completely different from the journey that I took because mm. the, the path I took, which is literally to just relentlessly submit <laughs> ideas to 2000 AD. That's not always possible anymore because their submissions sort of opens and closes with availability. But right. in as much as they even have a submissions policy, that's that's gold. You know, uh, I, I have a few American friends who have got their gig submitting to 2000 AD because it's one of the few places you can actually do that. Okay, because I didn't know that there was an openness 
to allow America. I feel I feel like that's sacrilege to allow America. <laughs> it's cheating, See, isn't you're it? You're right. Yeah. To, to let an American come to Tony Hugh Grant accent just to get a gig. Right. No, I think they what they want is people who can who can tell a good self-contained story. And you know, they're they're not they're not particularly biased about where those stories come from as long as they're good. And and it's funny, the the sort of um economy of plot and the the sort of slightly eyebrow arching cynical little bit cruel sense of humor that goes hand in hand with 2000 AD I, I think it's quite common among a lot of the the most successful American comic book writers as well as if there's some strange connective thing between between that sort of mind and comics in general which is interesting and probably Truly. a lot to unpack well, it's funny. I always uh, I, I've noticed and this is only this is because I'm, I was an English major. I, I've noticed a very th th there's a clear distinction between English and American writing for me. And I think it's that for America and, and I think it translates to comics as well, because I, I think of like some of my favorite or some of the like my my most well-known American comic book authors. And I compare them to some of the more, uh, you know, English oriented uh, writers. And I'm like. I think it still applies where Americans are endlessly, even hopelessly optimistic. There is even the most cynical among us are still like we're cynical because we're so optimistic. And yet the world continues to punch us down. Whereas uh, English authors are, and it's, it, I, I found that this is a common denominator with, uh, with, with British literature where mm -hmm. it's like, um, where it's like been there, done that mate. It's over. Like, well, I, mean, I, I think I think you're actually you're tapping into something quite profound uh, and right. Uh, the risk, of course, is that one ends up peddling in generalization, which we must. Absolutely. We must which I don't mean to do. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to do that caveat. But I, I do think there is a uh, a kind of defining character to to the, the sort of the British mentality versus the American mentality. And, and in my head, the really grotesquely simple way of putting it is that we used to be important. <laughs> we, <laughs> we had an empire that on which the sun never set famously. Precisely. And yet we're all now born into this world where we're not really very important anymore, but we sort of cling to this notion that we're in some way globally influential. But what what that sense of lost importance has left us with whether it's a legacy or a hangover I'm, I'm not quite sure is the sort of um halfway house capitalist socialist thing where we're all trying very hard to win the race in the sort of aren't we good capitalists sort of sense yes but also and and this is the the one and only moment that i get remotely patriotic about Britain, if you're broken or unwell or just in any way beaten by life, sooner or later, somebody will come and scrape you up and put you back on your feet for free. And it won't be perfect and it will take too long and you'll end up moaning about it because it wasn't as great as it should have been. But that... Um, what 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 a sort of uh, a, a died in the wall um, free market capitalist would sneeringly describe as as nanny state socialism? That's miraculous. Yes, and to be to be praised and clung to because it's being murdered before our eyes right now. Anyway, that's no, I, yeah. Um... Yet, no, <laughs> whereas the the sort of the American um, spirit as I see it, again, grotesquely sp simplifying, speaks in a, in a in quite a funny way to the sort of the, the, the legend of the, the Old West, which, you know, that, that time, that genre, that cliche never really existed the way we like to imagine it did. Exactly. And yet it speaks to frontier. It speaks to the responsibility of every human to tame whatever chaos is around them to stamp their mark upon the world and nobody's going to help you nobody's coming to save you it's down to you to get as high up that ladder as you can get and that's okay 
and and those are such different worldviews that we always forget. Like I always come to America and we speak the same language and we drink the same things and we eat the same stuff. And then somebody will say something they're like, holy fuck, yeah. we are so different in so yeah. many ways. And I, and I think that that distinction, generally speaking, means that the sort of cold black sense of humor that gives you Monty Python and, uh, you know, the IT crowd and <laughs> the office and, and all of those sort of quite grimy, disappointing, depressing worldviews that are absurd and funny, that translates quite neatly in in the Western direction in a way that not all American fiction translates in the other direction. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm groping for reasons why the British invasion is such a big deal. <laughs> 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 uh, well, and, and, yeah, well, yeah. Mm. That's that's all I got on that. I could rant away if I had a beer in my hand. <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's uh, I mean, the element of um, the lack of translation from American media overseas, despite its proliferation. You know, the fact that like it's ubiquitous throughout the world, and like you know, every story you hear is like, I learned English from movies. You know. Yeah. Um, yet you'll see this kind of like impact of the globalization of like culture on Hollywood media, particularly where they're like, we have to make sure we tailor it to this sensibility or this concept that we never did before. Like this, mm. I, I almost kind of miss it, but I don't know if I, if that's because I'm like an imperialist fascist or if I'm just a, uh, just a, just a culture junkie, like a pop culture junkie. But like, I kind of miss the like bullheaded Hollywood. Who gives a crap what they think over there? We're making a movie and it's going to, and John Wayne is going to be Genghis Khan. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. right. Yeah. But, uh, and we'll we'll link it to comics eventually, folks. But uh, you know the, uh, but I, I I kind of almost miss that like obstinate American. Let's just do it anyway, and we'll see if people like it. Because I I kind of that in the most gen, in the most generous way. That's almost kind of sweet. Where you're like, oh look at them, like they they're just so excited to make something. They just want to make it their way. Um, but anyway. <laughs> you're, trying, you're trying to goad me into being the the sort of uh, colonial paternal <laughs> figure. Oh, look at the little colonial. Yes, look at the Americans. They're 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 they're, they're with, relevant with their culture. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, speaking of, uh, I I'm uh, I'm a huge fan of what you've done with. Uh, well, okay, there it seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, or feel free to elaborate. But there seems to be this kind of like. Uh, biting not cynical but more i want to say almost disappointed uh <laughs> look at the world around you in your writing where yeah. there's always like a character who is super sharp and super quick-witted but also is like deeply disappointed in the world around him and i wanted to know if that was not necessarily intentional but certainly if it's like how you view the world around you. And if that's like a kind of, um, cause it seems like the characters that, that don't care the most do care the, like the deepest. And that's of course, I'm exemplified yeah. in Constantine. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the trick. I think that that last part, the, I don't know that it's, what's the best way to put this. It would be easy to, to say that this is some sort of unconscious, um, Mary Sueism trickling out <laughs> of me, where you know that's that's absolutely who I am, and it's it's not not really. It may be that I gravitate to those sorts of characters more because, um, well, multiple reasons. Uh, one, for instance, is that I can't bear sentimentality. I think that that's one. Really? Of the, yeah, that's one of the greatest problems with the world is that we we render important things through the filter of sentimentality and it reduces them to cliche and you mm. lose so much nuance you lose so much um of the important complexities of the world again sidebar <laughs> one of my greatest problems with writing superheroes is that at their worst they present a world that can be divided into people who are goodies and people who are baddies and right both of those camps in this world solve their problems using violence 
And all of these things are problematic unless they're handled with intelligence and heart. And I guess that's the point, because um, if, you, if you're writing a character like Constantine, then he can be dangled in a sentimental situation and you can get away with expressing that sort of human sentiment simply by redeeming yourself with John saying, what a load of bollocks or something like that. And it's, it's that way of, of taking the, the schmaltz out of it, adding yes. a little bit of sting, but then the prestige is the moment that your cynical character has to accept, usually silently, that there is something quite beautiful and awe-inspiring and special going on in life existence. Strip it away, apply as much cynicism as you want, be a selfish prick, and yet, generally speaking, when I wrote these characters, at the end of the story, there is a moment where they do the right thing, or they, uh, despite it being disgusting to them, express the importance of love, or they shed a tear, or whatever it may be. And like you can tell, even me talking about this, I have to reduce it to these slightly sarcastic tones because Absolutely. the the crusty, black-hearted British character is that we cannot ever admit to unadulterated emotion. But I think that makes it all the more powerful when the emotion trickles out anyway. Absolutely. It's funny that. Um... There is this uh, this kind of pulling away from sentimentality from a writer of the Dark Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. I mean, even Which, that is is not as sentimental as you might think. You know, it's it's sort of it's got some unusual cliche busting stuff in there. That's true. That's true. But I always found Jim Henson to be. I mean, maybe it's not even that he was deeply sentimental, but obviously the generations that followed him are about his creations. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I think that's I think that's true. I think it's I mean, maybe that speaks to another another sort of irritation of mine that uh in the same way that the the real world is is uh burdened by the future reduction of everything into entropy, systems slowly lose their coherence, everything ends up being useless. <laughs> Fictional realities for them the same danger that faces us with entropy is faced with detail. It's, yeah. it's about granularity. The, the more these fictional realities persist, the more people want to know, how does this work? How does that work? Let's get into that. Let's draw a map of this. Let's give that a name. Let's make sure that we understand the family tree of those people. Yeah. And it's murder for fiction. It's, it's the, the destruction of all wonder. So, you you know, with me at legacy, the Henson of it all. It's very difficult when you're given the, the the keys to a kingdom like that to sort of persuade people that the best thing you can do is to tread very lightly and to not speak too yeah. too specifically to things. The danger then, I guess, becomes that you end up peddling in the sentiment that, that we're talking about and yeah. sort of lean into the the kind of the, the character schmaltziness of it all. I think there's probably a, a, a happy medium. Um Every time I've so I did a, a labyrinth sequel and That's I right. did a wait it was a labyrinth prequel and a dark crystal sequel I'm yeah. hugely proud of them both but that was always the tension sort of juggling uh, respect and affection for the source material with the the sort of I want to add stuff to it but I don't want to try and explain things because that's going to kill the whole thing yeah I mean isn't that I think that that is at the core for why Star Wars isn't working the way it used to. Like, it's why, you know, Star Wars was a billion dollar movie empire, but not a billion dollar book empire. Mm. Like, you know, because the book sought to explain every single character you saw in the background and tell you every single detail about them. Like, mm -hmm. once, it, once Star Wars becomes science fiction and gets like detail oriented, yeah, you lose the audience. Like, the, you yeah. lose the whole the whole specialness of it. I um, tend to agree. I mean, what I will say is they did that very very clever and brave thing where. The new movie started coming out. The, I think it was roughly around the time that the sort of the new comics licenses were being handed out. They just decided that the entire expanded universe, they didn't throw it away. They mm -hmm. didn't burn it. They said, this is all mythology now. This yes. has become the in-world version of folklore and legend. 
And that's brilliant. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it's perfect. It hasn't quite worked out because you end up going back to that and mining it and people go, oh, exactly. I that curry is a giant bunny <laughs> and, and all that shit. But it's a really brave way of dealing with the the eventual necessity that all of these shared universes have to deal with the fact that they're impenetrable right. because they have so much shared history and so much convoluted bullshit going on that you can't get into it unless you're prepared to spend five years reading everything else oh exactly yeah and that's that's i think a problem with um the approach to at least western comics today which is like what do i need to get started like what mm. work do i have to do in Maybe order to in. enjoy fiction <laughs> and it's like you're, it's, you're, you're right. It's tricky though as well, isn't it? Because if you're if you're a creator for any of these brands, one always slightly suspects that the creators who service the the continuity are the ones who are being rewarded. Yes. <laughs> for their for their in you know, their their deep knowledge. Yeah. Whereas it's always been my view that um, like continuity should be an Easter egg. To those mm. who who are familiar with it, rather than a hurdle to those who are not. Right. It's funny. I mean, look, this is a, a seamless segue. You know, the the whole uh, Krakoa era that we've been dealing with recently. Yeah. Um, in my view, one of, if not the most interesting pieces of divergent thought that has been applied to this funny little subgenre that we call superhero comics. Um, Hickman came along, saw the potential to do something in the in the sort of 1970s hard science fiction mold. You know, your your sort of Asimovs and your Herberts who would go like, right, it's not about laser guns. It's right. about how we can sustain an empire. And, yeah. and that's huge. Social engineering levels, the metaphors for the entire X line, they didn't stop being human metaphors. They continued to be about prejudice and otherness and othering and all of those things. But they also became about state level uh, contests and nation building and these huge important metaphors that work in concert with the human ones. That's brilliant. Yeah. And everything that has trickled from that, it's not always been great. Some of it's been dreadful, but it's generally speaking all been very interesting and yes. it really worth exploring the problem he said putting words into the mouth of people way above his pay grade that haven't <laughs> actually expressed this to him but i'm assuming because it's not it's not rocket science right. the problem is that four years down the line you say to somebody oh have you read the latest x-men comic and they're like well do i have to also read the last four years of X -Men? <laughs> that's a problem and we have tried with some success to mitigate that problem by creating openings, but it's still intimidating to, yeah. to be told that you should be getting into this and not really knowing where to start. And that is a problem in, in micro, which affects the entire big two shared universe milieu in macrocosm, because how the fuck do you start? Where do you get in? Right, um, yeah. With, with X-Men, I... Well, with X-Men particularly, I think that it has never been easier to get into X-Men and well, the, well, I mean, and I'm, I have a vested interest in it. I talk about comic books for a living. So, but you know, the, the fact is the, 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 in the DNA of this whole initiative, there has been jumping on points. There has been this kind of like, I think it's, I think that the, 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 the reluctance of the audience or, or swaths of the audience to jump in or to get into it or, you know, the reticence to, to, uh, tr to, to try it or read more mm -hmm. of it or, is, is laid in its high concept. You know, like, I know if Magneto shows up and starts messing up Times Square, I, I know what that means, you know. But this heady, like like you said, with nation building and, you know, it, it even, you know, the easy to poke fun at, like the like the free love orgy fest that, like, Krakoa implied but actually never paid off, uh, it, it, it makes a standard capes and tights comic book reader a little squeamish or maybe a little bit intimidated. You yep. know, it's maybe not even... And I hate to say it. I, I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that it's like it's too. People feel like it might be too smart for them. I think that it's more just like I've never seen anything like that, and I don't really know how to get my footing because there is 
always an element of familiarity when it mm. comes to me jumping into a comic book. And What's, just, okay, so I have questions, but they're oh, probably sure. they're like one of those dreadful Q&A bits at the end of a panel <laughs> where somebody stands up and says, this isn't so much of a question as a statement. Right, yeah, um, I'll take a statement. The, the fear I have is that what you describe is an expression of something that bothers me, mm. which is the normalization to the extent that it becomes expected, in fact, yes. to the extent that it becomes coterminous with quality of same, same shit. Right. Things, and, and the way you just describe it is extremely good. People are comfortable with things that feel like stuff they're already familiar with. Like there's this term used in comics, playing the hits, right? Oh, you know, yeah. Like, I, I you, just heard that the other day. Yeah. Right. No. And it makes you realize that actually what some people want is, isn't is original singer-songwriters. It's, it's fucking karaoke. That's, that's sort of what has become. Now, that's crap and frightening and a little bit depressing. <laughs> yes. Especially productive. somebody like me who just despises that. I, I won't, if something reads remotely familiar to something I've, I've read before, then why the fuck am I bothering? That's, Actually. that's not enriching me. It's not entertaining me, but I'm a snob. Um, <laughs> my fear is that this is the product of a slow process that can almost entirely be pinned on and hear me out here. The monopoly of the distributor ah. over the last decades. Okay, okay. And the, the reason that I get to this, this is a little line of dominoes. If you're a retailer in the comic book industry, this is no longer quite as true now that we have a ton of different distributors and we have digital comics and all the rest of it. But I'm talking about, you know, old school. Right. You own a bricks and mortar comic store. You put your new comics out every Wednesday. FOC for a particular title is like between FOC and uh, final sales, you've got like three days to figure out how many, how many of a, a particular copy, uh, a particular issue to order. Yep. You're only ever one bad week away from bankruptcy. <laughs> Naturally. So what is your only strategy? Oh, your familiar. strategy is familiarity. You will yeah. invest in anything that you've seen before. It's got the big name on it. It's got a story in it that people have already seen. You know exactly how many people are going to buy it, so you can order exactly that number. Yes. Then here comes this British prick Spurrier who wants to tell weird cosmic horrors or, or you know, I'm, I'm being solipsistic, but you know what I mean. And, and suddenly they're like, well... This looks good, and when I read it, I enjoyed it, but I don't know how to sell this. This I have right. no idea how many people are going to buy it, so I'll probably order low on this. Does it then follow, is my question, finally, that readers, comic store customers, have been exposed to normality, ordinary stuff, the same stuff again and again for so long that they have come to assume that that is what they enjoy? Yes. Or, or is that not giving people enough credit? I don't uh, no, know. I, I, well, you know, people, people are both complicated and uncomplicated. And we are like, we see faces on Mars. We see patterns in the wallpaper. We are conditioned to embrace the familiar and the recognizable. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, we are uncomplicated and easily manipulatable. On the oh, other yeah. hand, there are also, uh, on the other hand, the culture shock of being exposed to something new, couched as the familiar sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, but seeing something new and having it affect you is so much more palpable. It's like eating rice cakes and then being offered a peach. Just yep. that your palate shift is so you are your senses are over, are bombarded by stimuli and you are changed, which is, you know, which is great for, you know, the the hypothetical size spurriers out there who are looking to change the, the, the zeitgeist uh, one book at a time. Um, and I think that that doesn't equate to sales <laughs> necessarily. No, no. Uh, that's the problem, you know, and but uh, so it's 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 a multifaceted issue, as you as you pointed out. But like, um, so it's like, yeah, no, I think I think you, I think you're definitely keying into something important and something that may account for why 
the homogenization of Western comics is uh, both detrimental to the culture, but also uh, the the norm. Yeah. You know, like you're not going to get it's hard enough to sell Silver Surfer. How do you sell in thy name? It's it's, a you know, that put put pictures of Silver Surfer on the cover. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah. the whole. In, you know what I mean? Like that. And it just feels like such a it feels so shameful. Yeah. To have to play that game, to have to say, I am packaging this in a way that is not going to scare you. It's not going to make you think there's anything new or troubling. Right. Not going to have a moral of this story. I'm not a political creature. It doesn't have to be <laughs> about anything, guys. It's just fun. And then you buy it and it's actually about something and hopefully you don't even realize. But that's that's kind of crap. <laughs> well, it is. It's deceptive and it's duplicitous, but it's like and but, you know, no one ever said that marketing was an art form. Maybe they, um, except for marketers. Uh, marketing is ugly uh, and it's terrible. Explain. Right? If you're like, in advertising, it, kill yourself. Exactly. Like, advertising is... Oh, that's a big market. The advertisers kill yourself market. That's a good dollar. I want yeah, that right? <laughs> the mar- like, it's, it's It's work, you know? That's dirty, uh, you know, hard work to sell, you know? Because re- at the end of the day, there's also the, like, the the struggle of the artist, right? Mm-hmm. Which is like, you know, I want to express myself and be original and, and, and not, you know, fall into the trappings of the system, but also I need to eat and I want to keep doing this. You know, I want to keep, I, I want to keep creating and yep. I need to be able to create and I need to be able to sell the things I create in order to keep creating things. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, self-sustaining. Um, I think that the, I mean, there seems to be, thankfully, a increase in quality as we increase the amount of books we produce. Like I think today we're producing more books than ever. And I think that the books that we're producing today are statistically better than they've ever been though. And that's only because the, in the past, you know, cause I say this all the time. I, I'm always like, Oh, there's more books today that are amazing than ever yeah. before. And they're like, how dare you? I can name on one hand, the amount of amazing books that came out in the eighties. And I'm like, that's right. That's right. You can count on one to two hands the amount of out of the thousands of books that were produced from 1980 to 1989. You can count on two hands mm-hmm. the amount of amazing books. I would need multiple hands this year to count out the amazing books that came out this year. You know, it's like I think people are being conditioned to gravitate towards the new and the exciting. Oh, I hope you're right. I, I really just do. I, but I, I don't know how much of that will stand. Like you know, we talk about those great books, of the eighties. I'm I'm sure I wasn't I wasn't reading comics, so I don't know for sure. But I'm I'm sure if you were there, there were a ton more great books that you read and then forgot about a month later. And, totally. and what we're talking about is the ones that sort of remain with us, the ones that were so important to us culturally or personally that they've yeah. they've clung to our, our memories, what is it, 40 years later. Exactly. Oh God, we're all so old. <laughs> <laughs> well look at look at the 90s with Vertigo, right? Like there are, everybody remembers the three Vertigo f- titles that changed everything. You know, yep. but rarely do people talk about how much they miss vamps or you know ape and angel. Yep. <laughs> you know yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Not to not to disparage those books. I'm just, but you know those, but uh, yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, to to sort of counter my own argument slightly. Okay. I did uh, X Men Legacy all those years ago. Story yes. in which the the sort of the, the quintessential X person metaphor ceased to be speaking to race or sexuality or anything like that. And it was used to talk about mental health and this, this central character who was um, in, in sort of power set terms, uh, godlike, unstoppable, but could not overcome his own challenges, his own yeah. mental challenges. And it was presented very much as a superhero book and I still laugh today about the number of dreadful reviews I got for that first issue, like, you know, one out of 10, like 20 of those in the first issue. Yeah. Um, and then whatever, 24 issues later, when it was finally ended, those exact same people were saying, how could they cancel this book? It's a, and and that, <laughs> you know, that warms me in, in a cold evening. Yeah. But to, to the point, if this gets a little bit, Maudlin, um, when I have those moments of, have I done well? Have I been a good writer? Have I done comics well? 
and I kind of project myself forwards to some hypothetical deathbed where I'm lying surrounded by my family who love me so well and my my last breath is rattling from my lungs I'm thinking what will be the things that make me proud mm. in that moment and it's not the sorts of things that drive the ambitious me the little the little voice in me that's like you need to write some batman oh you've never done any iron man you need to make sure you do some iron man do a forgettable run of thor everybody will love you for that <laughs> the, the thing that's actually in my head will be have i believed what i wrote right have i changed anybody's lives including my own can you live with yourself <laughs> and X-Men Legacy, packaged though it was as a superhero comic, playing all those disgusting, shameful tricks that we've just been talking about of pretending to be familiar, not really having a message, all of that stuff, dressing up in the tights and the cape. Right. Even now, 10 years later, I can't go to a, a convention without at least one person coming up to me and expressing something along the lines of, I read that when I was at the darkest place in my life and it gave me the strength to go on. Yeah. Now, it is always my immediate reaction to say, I did not give you any strength to go on. That came from you. I'm overwhelmed and full of pr pride that something I wrote could have helped you yeah. <laughs> find, find the strength that was already within you. But what a thing to be able to say. You know, I, I, wrote, I wrote this funny little superhero story and yet it seems to have made a difference to people's lives. So to completely contradict all my moaning that I was doing a moment ago, mm -hmm. clearly you can present something in a familiar form and then quietly do something interesting with it. Absolutely. I guess they just present that you have to play that game. I want to just, I want to do a book called Mental Health Man and for people to buy it in their tens of thousands rather than a hundred people at a convention, which is- yes. Yeah, and I think, uh, uh, you know, we didn't, Rome wasn't built in the day, the Federation wasn't built without World War III. Uh, you know, you got to get there. It's just, you got to do the work to get there. We'll, we'll get we'll get there someday. And, and you yeah. know, for every one, you know, there, there's always uh, the creators that talk about, like, you know, you do one for them, one for me. So I don't, I don't see any uh, in your bibliography where you're like, where you completely, time. where you completely <laughs> sold that, where you're like, here's this. And yeah. I, I, had, I don't want to say sell out, because I don't necessarily believe in that. Like, I don't think it's, I think it's reductive to say that, but um, I, I will key into a point you made about um, X-Men Legacy because you really seem to respond to Legion. You have a real soft spot for him because he shows up in everything uh, mm -hmm. X-related and uh, your depiction of his relationship with Charles is something that uh, nearly every X-Writer seems to, to, to shy away from. Like we were really excited to explore it when we invented him and invented this really marketable Age of Apocalypse period. And that's kind of it. And it's really interesting to see that relationship and how it's explored and how rarely it is, but how uh, you're like, don't, mm -mm, no, that's don't your son. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's important. Yeah. But I mean, uh, it all comes from, there's a book and I wish I could remember the name of the book and I can't, it's been many, many years since I read it. And it's written by the daughter of a very well-known anti-apartheid campaigner in South Africa. And um, her mother was, it was a woman, her mother was so utterly successful as, a, as an anti-apartheid campaigner and fought the good fight, was imprisoned multiple times, got into endless trouble with the, the authorities, and yet was a shit mum. Mm. just a shit mum and, and sort of had to be a shit mum because when you are so selflessly giving of yourself to your defining struggle how can you possibly present yourself as this safe continuity giving character which is what, what a parent sort of needs to be um and the beauty of that book, and again, I wish I could remember the name. I'll try and look it up. The beauty of that book was that the daughter, as an adult, had come to terms with the fact that she didn't blame her mum for this, that right. there was a decision. We like to believe, going back to the sort of the sentimental Hollywood cliche, we like to believe that there's no 
uh, limit to love. It's possible to love more and more every day and you can give of yourself more and more every day. You can't. You can't. Everybody has a limit. There's a ceiling on happiness and there's a ceiling on how much you can give of yourself to the world. And it's my contention that somebody like Xavier would be a terrible dad. Right. <laughs> and, and not even, like, you know, people say, yeah, but he didn't even know about David's existence until he was, and fine, that's granular. That's not really what we're talking about here. The subtext is, isn't it interesting that you can have a cause and devote yourself to a cause and live the cause and be the cause and have the dream, but still be quite a bad human. <laughs> right. Still be, a, still be a bit rubbish at the things that most of us on a relatable level deal with every day. Um, and that interests me. And what's even more interesting about it, and I only sort of came to this recently, having thought through and, and sort of written through David for the various Krakowin things, is that if you if you start to see a person who has been raised by an ideologue, a fanatic, then, and you start to see them in, in any sort of um, inheritance light, you start to, like for instance, we, we were gradually working to this idea that perhaps Legion is presenting himself as the heir to the throne of X. Right. And that that may or may not still happen. I'm pretty sure it won't happen. But that was kind of the road that we were on without quite knowing where it would end. And it, it came to me quite quickly that if you're in a struggle like the one Xavier is on, which, you know, let's, let's not beat around the bush. It speaks to civil rights. It speaks to equality, all of that stuff. Um, and we can name plenty of, of real world firebrands, demagogues, spokespeople, brave activists who have struggled for that. I think if and when those struggles are won, the people who have been fighting for them would make the worst leaders. Right. Because what characterizes them is the fight, yeah. the relentlessness of the fight, the inability to grind them down, the selflessness with which they throw themselves against the wall. But when you win the thing that you've been fighting for, usually in some watered down, compromised form, and the struggle ceases to be about let's get the thing, and instead it becomes about we must hang on to the thing and we must make sure that the thing is fair, those people aren't the people you want in charge anymore. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and so I was sort of trying to set David up as this person who would be the one that you want in charge. Somebody who's been flawed, knows what it is to be vulnerable, doesn't believe that everything they say has to be correct immediately, does hesitate, does want advice, does want, like the whole idea was that he was the head and Nightcrawler was the heart. And if you put them together, you've got the ultimate heir to the, the throne of X. Yeah. One of the tragedies is that that was never ever going to happen, and I sort of knew that. Getting it, <laughs> it was a fun thing to be working towards. Yeah, um, I have no point to make with any of this. Just that isn't that interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. No, I love that idea, and I it never occurred to me that Professor X is a soldier. That Professor X is not going to inherit the kingdom he's trying to build. And there's so many biblical metaphors yeah. that you can play with. You know, Absolutely. He, he will see the promised land, but he will never set foot in it. Yeah. No, that's, oh, man. All right. Well, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You you do seem to uh, to love Nightcrawler quite a bit uh, because Nightcrawler seems to be kind of like this. He he is, though, I, I, idealistic and uh, has yep. this kind of like he wears his heart on the sleeve. Um how does that translate to Uncanny Spider-Man, which feels like the most superhero-y comic book <laughs> that you've ever made? Uh, I mean, it's not bad, I'm, uh, you know, but it's it it's this it's. If you guys haven't been reading Uncanny Spider-Man, you should. First of all, it should also be a skin in the Spider-Man game. Um, but the it's this marriage of like here is a X-Men Nightcrawler book that seems to have to use Spider-Man stuff in it. Like the, the utilization of, of, of tombs and Rhino and like, this just like the, 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 I don't know, the window dressing of Spider-Man in an X-Men book. And I'm just like, where did that come from? And, you know, and, and how much, you know, how much fun are you having ex executed? I mean, despite myself, so much fun. And, and, and funnily enough, I realize now, 
apropos the whole extended rant I just had about window dressing and, and having to, to sort of pretend that you're doing a straight spandex book when actually you're not, that applies <laughs> so perfectly here. Yeah. Um, the, the journey up to this point, um, it was kind of a hospital pass, right? So Hickman set up this thing in one of the early X-Men books where Nightcrawler says, I think I'm going to have to create a mutant religion. Yes. And if you're an editor in comics today and somebody sets that up, there's only a few names in your Rolodex who you're going to reach for. And that weirdo cerebral prick who thinks he's working for 1990s Vertigo every day is me. <laughs> so they, they came to me. And it's a very difficult brief because um, Nightcrawler's Catholicism is so tightly bound with his backstory and his identity that to toss any of that away would have been a dreadful mistake or at least would have got me death threats from all those kind cheek turning christians out there um so yeah. that wasn't going to happen and instead i sort of came up with what i thought was a rather lovely fusion of science fiction and sort of um tau level mortality in which if you if you can conceive of a society where death has been to some degree or another defeated, then you need new sorts of philosophies to guide your actions. Right. Morality and ethics continue, religion continues to hold sway, but there are some new notions that you need to tie into your world. And that, that, that sort of series of logic gates and the explorations we had of them still holds up in my view. There are things I would do very differently given the same time again. But in general, I'm pretty chuffed with all that stuff. But where we've got to is this character of Nightcrawler, who if I had just been doing a solo book about him having adventures, it would have been joyous and swashbuckly and fun with the undercurrent of thoughtful stuff, which is where I tend to, to, to go to. Yeah. Instead, it's all been thoughtful stuff. It's all been heavy, 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 big ideas with an undercurrent of fun stuff, which I've tried my hardest to kind of build in. And that became too much eventually, a little exhausting. Mm. So I engineered a way of saying, we need to have some fun. We need him to just be a hero who swings around. And the idea that arose was the big picture of the X-Men, the Krakoan era is all falling apart. Mutants are, back on the lamb, they are public enemy number one. Nightcrawler specifically has been framed for a bunch of dreadful murders. So it could have just been a fugitive book. Yeah. But it occurred to me that nobody has used superheroing as therapy before. Like if you're traumatized and on the run and the whole world seems against you and you're super, super lonely, a really nice day would be to go and save somebody from a mugger. Right. And that's kind of what he's doing. And that allows us to have a lot of fun and to play the swashbuckling card and to just lean into the the joyous spandexy street level stuff. But PS, because I'm me and Sai got a Sai, <laughs> it's all self-deception. It's all the desperate attempt of a post-traumatic person to displace from their trauma and their responsibility using <laughs> using silly spandex stuff to avoid the big questions yeah and what what i love because i love dicking around with like convention generally speaking the rule is you're not allowed to have a passive protagonist they've got to be proactive they've got to be driving their own story right the first half of this whole thing is nightcrawler desperately trying to stay the fuck out of this big story. Yeah. That is doing everything in its power to reach out and drag him back into it. You're a mutant. You need to deal with mutants. <laughs> it's like this Spider-Man telling him, do you, you did say that you would be focusing on the big picture stuff and Silver Sable keeps giving him these little pep talks. Everything in his world, including his little imaginary friend, is constantly saying, mutant, 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 mutant. And he's going, no, I just want to save a mugger. Is that so bad? Can I just yeah. be here? And that's a fascinating tension to me. And, and it, it sort of lets us play both sides of that coin. It can be the spurrier, high, highfalutin, wanky shit, but also the, <laughs> the, the bamfing around having fun stuff. Yeah. 
and it's a it, it's it's a blast you're um there's there's so many more things to talk about i don't want to i don't want to overdo it i warned it. you i was a waffler <laughs> i love it this is fantastic this has been this has been a fantastic conversation uh but i but i i would be remiss if i didn't also say coda has returned yes uh, so pick up coda folks um x-men blue origins number one is coming in late november so people should check that out as well uh can you tease that a little bit um no almost, <laughs> no fuck you table flip yeah no um almost entirely not because anything i say will spoil it other than to say it will be the definitive origin story of the mystique nightcrawler question of parentage yes. uh, which we thought had been solved but i assure you has not excellent uh, and also you're writing The Flash, which yeah. is an unexpected and uh, delightful uh, departure for um, The Flash and for Wally. Uh, the first issue in particular, uh, its depiction of um, postpartum and post superheroing depression is <laughs> haunting and uh, is, is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's added a you know a basement to the to wally that uh he's lacked in a while and it's really it's really something else um what led you to doing flash at all like what was that what was that conversation like where it was like yeah i think i'll write about this happy speedster <laughs> um yeah it doesn't seem like a an obvious home run does it it's funny the 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 boring truth is that um i had a stretch of about three months where I was offered a series of jobs, each of which in isolation were can't say no sort of jobs. Mm. There was a continuation of Coda. There was a second series of Damn Them All with Charlie Adlard, which means the world to me. There was more Hellblazer. There was yes. the Uncanny Spider-Man thing. All of these things which are, are not only good for the, the fucking greasy ladder climb of of career nonsense which we're all allegedly supposed to be worried by uh -huh. but also were just stories that i knew would mean something to me and and you know back to the deathbed scene oh so i <laughs> but he just remembered he got to do another another series of hellblazer um yeah. and then along comes the the wonderful chris rosa from from dc saying hey so si. uh he so he uh knew me from his days at boom so to go right back to the the sort of the dark crystal and labyrinth of it all, he was sort of adjacent to all of that stuff. So what goes around really does eventually come back around again. Yeah. And he thought of me when this opportunity arose and he said, what would you pitch for The Flash? And I was in this privileged position where I didn't need the work. In fact, to to get the work would have, and in fact did actively make my life considerably harder. Mm. So I was able to say, all right, I'm just gonna pitch something totally from the heart, totally strange. Um, it has always felt obvious to me that the Flash should be a vehicle for big cosmic scary thoughts. And it has always felt obvious to me that somebody who can be in a dozen places at once, who is spinning a thousand plates, husband, hero, father, role model. It's always felt obvious to me that that person is going to crack. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all grown ups living in stressful worlds to imagine somebody who can handle all this stuff is nice to see somebody who can handle it, but is also admitting that they're under stress and, and really struggling with that many different threads in their life. That's something that might actually be important and valuable to people. So it all just sort of wrote itself in this pitch and I had no expectations of it being accepted because it was like, this is such a departure. And then the fuckers said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, to, I had to make good on my plans. But it, it's, it's just sort of flowed. It's, it's so, people are really, why the hell would you think that Flash would make a good vehicle for cosmic horror? And I'm so confused by the question because it's so obvious to me. It just seems so obvious. Um, here is a, here is a character, in fact, a whole family of characters defined by, in brand terms, defined by their ability to access this mysterious energy, which allows them to break the laws of physics, to move through time, to do all these incredible, impossible things. And yet not one of them has the slightest notion how it works. Right. 
and and over the decades different writers have tried to have clever science guy pop up and say i've worked out how the site the speed force works and then two weeks later somebody will say something completely different and they don't they don't match up they don't make sense and it occurred to me that the only way all of these things can be true and yet false is if there is some quantum uncertainty involved in it where even attempting to observe what's going on causes it to change mm. and that sends you down a path of um, almost metaphysical sentience and the the image that kept coming to my mind to go right back to our our difference between brits and americans see how many callbacks we're doing here see? We're doing yeah you said you wouldn't remember but i know right the the sort of quintessential american frontiersman striding across <laughs> a plane realizing that there's an oil field under it hammering his drill down into the oil and he's like black gold this is going to enrich me it's going to enrich this town it's going to enrich this nation based on this boundless natural resource we will create opportunities and progress and wealth for all there is no bad thing about what has happened today mm -hmm. and then you cut forward 200 years and there are people choking in hospital beds and cars killing us all and lung cancer all over the place and the ozone layers falling to bits and that's not exactly what's going to happen in the flash but it's it's about that it's about we're doing this thing using it for the very best reasons because we're good people but we haven't got the slightest idea what it might be doing yeah why it's working and what might be happening and that's that's just a little slice of where we're going with this awesome oh cool <laughs> <laughs> that's my very american sensibility just like neat um <laughs> hope uh also quick shout out to step by bloody step uh completely wordless uh book with uh collaboration uh do i pronounce it matthias yes uh matthias bagara uh gorgeous book incredible uh really quick i just wanted to shout it out because you know it's an image book and i know uh some folks are on the hook for that when it doesn't uh <laughs> you know so pick up step, step by bloody step uh how how much fun was that to challenge yourself to be like completely wordless you know, I mean, you, you will have gleaned by now that I'm a bit of a wordy person. So it's it was, true, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it was astonishing. And and a, an overstated axiom is that comics is collaboration, but it's so true. And when you find a collaborator with whom you are synergizing effortlessly, um, when, when I work with Matty, the again cliche sorry talking cliches today the 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 two of us become far better far greater than the sum of our parts i don't really need to write very much for him to understand what i mean and for him to run with it and take it in directions that i didn't expect awesome i have this simple metric when i write a script that if if when i see the artwork come into my inbox if i can remember how it looked in my head when i wrote the script then something's gone wrong Mm. Most of the time, you immediately eclipse whatever idea you had originally with the, the image of the actual thing. Not once when Matthias turns in pages to me have I had the slightest remembrance of what I was thinking <laughs> of when I wrote. But yeah, no, it just flows. There's a reason we went straight back to Coda. We love working together. Step by Bloody Step was such a challenge and such a steep learning curve. And... If we had more hours and were in a pub, I could bore you with how interesting it is to see how people digest a story that has no words in it. And I think it's yeah. quite different. I think, to give you a very brief overview of this, I think that we're all trained to dip into a panel and read the words and then look at the imagery to confirm or juxtapose with what we've just learned from the words and then to hop on to the next yes. panel. And when there aren't any words, every single frame becomes an investigation you have to figure out why the fuck are they showing us this what does this mean yeah 
and it's exhausting. <laughs> people, <laughs> like, people, given it's it's a book with no words, you would think it takes no time at all to read, but actually people are taking breaks because their brains are sore from reading this thing. Yeah. And we quickly realized you have to throw in big aching spaces every few pages just to give people the chance to go, ah, that's nice. Okay. <laughs> let's go back. Anyway, that's just a little a little snippet of how quickly we had to learn how to do this. Yeah. But it's I mean, it's one of the books I am proudest of in all the world. I'm painfully aware of the irony of being a, a famously wordy writer that one of the best things I've ever done hasn't got a single word in it. <laughs> I'll take that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, congratulations on the continuation of Hellblazer, because <laughs> I know how much that book means to you. And I'm so yeah. thrilled to see that you're getting you're getting more Hellblazer. Um that's you know my my wife was the one who was like oh new hellblazer i've been very disappointed by hellblazer in the past uh <clears throat> new attempts at hellblazer and yeah. so she was like ah there he is <laughs> like we, ah. we couldn't be happy i mean I, I was i was chatting to aaron about aaron campbell the artist i was chatting yes, to him it was incredible, about by the way. another fantastic collaborator that i'll keep working with as long as he lets me because Please. we just sort of synergized yeah we we agreed that we never ever really truly believed that we weren't going back. It wasn't like, you know, Oh, they've, they've cut us off in our prime and we're, we were furious. Don't get me wrong. We were pissed off and we were disappointed. But when they finally turn around and we're like, you know what, we've crunched the numbers and we think you would, we, we could do more. Let's do some more. It wasn't like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I never saw this coming. It was more like, thank fucking God. <laughs> so long. Come on, off we go. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was a, a sort of assumed thing that we would eventually go back to it and, and a great sense of relief that we're finally back on that. <laughs> wagon. Good, yeah. good. Uh, and finally, uh, I hope you get to do more Elsa Bloodstone. I loved yeah. your portrayal of her <laughs> in Marvel zombies back in the day. Uh, such you. a great book. That was, that was an un, that was an unrestricted time for Marvel where they were just like, how about like what an open opportunity for everybody. Just how about this? Yeah. Marvel zombies. Not, it, I think it's emblematic of a lot of what we were talking about throughout this conversation. So I wanted to bring it up because I'm like, Hey, if you want to know more about like what we were talking about, read Marvel zombies, because it is that it is it a deeply unsentimental, sentimental, sentimental person who is chased by it. And it's just, Oh, great yeah and anyway. some of those parent themes as well we're sort of creating some recurrent motifs here aren't we yes Gosh. we are indeed uh <laughs> but for now i want to thank you so much for being here si thank you so much for watching That's everybody pleasure. i'm sorry uh, for yammering on for so long <laughs> this is this has been a delight it's been I, I i would love to do this again hopefully we can in the future because mm. i feel like we'd get a completely different uh different take and uh, there's more works to be to be explored um but for now Thanks for being here uh, Great to do uh, because we're talking about uh, corporate greed and graft and marketing. Um, uh, what's the website they need to go to to see more Simon Spurrier? Is there or should we just say just read my I'm, books? And I'm pretty bad at that. stuff. I do have a website, simonspurrier.co.uk. Uh, I don't update it nearly as often as I should. I'm still on what used to be called Twitter. That probably ah, yes. won't last forever. I'm just at 